Well, greetings, you hurly burlyites, you intrepid ears, you merry band of insight seekers. If you recall last week's pod, we took up political residence in British Columbia. This week, we're heading in the opposite direction, as far east as you can go in this country, with a very notable guest, the Honorable Andrew Fury, 14th Premier of Newfoundland and Labrador. First sworn in in August of 2020, and then the winner of a majority government in March 2021, Dr. Fury is an orthopedic trauma surgeon and an educator with Memorial, Memorial University's School of Medicine. His education includes a diploma in organizational leadership from Oxford. In 2010, he helped create the Newfoundland and Labrador-born charity Team Broken Earth, which has provided relief and participated in medical missions in Haiti, as well as Bangladesh, Ethiopia, Guatemala, and Nicaragua. And in 2017, he was named the Canadian Red Cross's Humanitarian of the Year for Newfoundland and Labrador. So just another one of those run-of-the-mill CVs to fly across your desk every day, early burlyites. Today on the pod, we'll dive a little deeper into Premier Fury's background and also chat about energy, wind, hydro, our climate future, and Newfoundland's prospects for being a green hydrogen producer. Premier Fury's at the table at these healthcare negotiations. He's talked about the need for reform. What does he mean by that exactly? And what's his take on Premier Ford's approach? Given that Newfoundland has the highest percentage of vaccinations among the provinces, what are his cultural observations about COVID, both what we've come through and where we go from here? And finally, as the only remaining Liberal Provincial Premier, along with the Yukon Territory, we'll get his take on the future of large L Liberals across Canada, federally and provincially. It's a pretty ambitious agenda, but you're used to that kind of thing, <laughs> Premier. Wow, it's only 30 minutes, right? That seems aggressive. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, you're here for an hour, like it or oh, not. Okay, well, there we go. All right. <laughs> we can squeeze some of that in, I think. All right, we'll try to, we'll try to get there. Uh, so, you know, we have had uh, distinguished people from Newfoundland here before, uh, but really pleased to have you, the Premier, with us today. Um, uh, happy to be here, David. I know. Well, thank you for making, taking the time and making the time. So you are uh, a lifer, as near as I can tell from your resume, born and raised in Newfoundland, Labrador. Is that right? I am indeed. I'm very proud to be from The Rock. Right. You never thought of leaving when you were younger? Uh, no, not at all. I mean, I left to do some medical training. Uh, I did my uh, fellowship in trauma in Baltimore and um, no, always had a desire, as many Newfoundlanders do, who travel uh, from the province uh, for work or pleasure. Every, there's a magnetic pull to Newfoundland and Labrador that I'm sure exists in other places, but I would argue is not, not as strong. Um, there's just a magnetism to the place that uh, draws people back. It's a sense of place, a sense of home, a sense of community. And very, very proud to live here and very proud to occupy this position right now. Hey, that's a, that, that is an interesting phenomenon and people don't want to leave, right? They, there's something about... No, it's the, it's the, uh, how, do you, how do you determine the, the Newfoundlander in heaven? You know, he's the one who's trying to get home. <laughs> you, know, it's a, it's a, you know, everybody is drawn to the place. There's a, as you know, it's, it's uh, it, the cultural experience is, is, is fantastic. The, uh, but there's something special. There's something, there's a, there's a, there's a special sauce uh, to Newfoundland and Labrador. And it really draws anybody who has ever been here uh, from here or not back to here many, many times. Cool. So yeah. you, um, you were born in uh, 1975. I was on my way to Thanks high school. Thanks for reminding me of that. <laughs> well, fuck yeah. you. I was on my way to high school, <laughs> right? <laughs> What was it like growing up uh, for you? What was life like when you were growing up in the 80s and 90s? What kind of family did you have? Where'd you live? What was going on? Yeah, so uh, very fortunate to come from a very strong family, one that uh, has a long history of public service. Um, and uh, we, my father was a teacher. Uh, I owe a great deal to my father. My father is a uh, has shown me a great path in life. Um, he was uh, both my mom and dad are Newfoundlanders and Labradorians. Uh, dad grew up in Mount Cashel, um, went on to become a teacher, uh, then went on to take the whole family when I was uh, just starting school and move us and displace us to Halifax, uh, where he studied law, came back. Uh, set up shop, uh, mom and pop law shop on Duckworth Street and uh, practice law for uh, for many years and then uh, was appointed by Prime Minister Chrétien to the Senate. 
And so he's kind of shown me a, a path of a public service. It's one that I've tried to emulate. Uh, I, no doubt I feel like I come from a background of privilege, but it's one that was born out of uh, a different path and one that I think that I try to reflect in my current job, but also in my my previous life, whether that's trying to give back as much as I possibly can, either through the charitable work uh, in foreign countries or here at home uh, with starting a you know a, a mental health a national mental health charity. So um, I enjoyed growing up in Newfoundland and Labrador. There's no better place to grow up. Um, I'm I'm sure as you would argue Saskatchewan is I'm sure very similar, uh, but uh, it was a great upbringing, uh, very well rounded. Um, Newfoundland and Labrador is a very special place where you, everybody knows everybody, and uh, I think it's that sense of community, that sense of belonging to a place, uh, virtually or <laughs> physically, metaphysically perhaps that uh, that is makes it special, makes you feel like you're part of a, a true uh, community, and it's one that you know I've. Uh, always been honored to be a part of. Uh, of course, I grew up when you were headed to high school. When I was headed to high school, the, the COD moratorium hit, uh, you know, just I was just graduating high school when the, when the COD moratorium uh, struck uh, Newfoundland and Labrador. So, uh, I mean, that is a, a generational historic moment uh, that occurred in, in our province. And and it was interesting uh, to grow up in that time. Uh, people see the challenges of Newfoundland and Labrador and they wonder how we got here. Well, 1992 and 93 are largely responsible for where we are today, whether that's the demographic crisis, the economic crisis that seems to ebb and flow. But the, you can't understate the demographics and, uh, situation that is a result of the COD moratorium. Every, many of the people I went to high school with left just overnight. 30,000, I mean, not just to remind people, 30 to 40,000 people were put out of work overnight. They didn't stay in those communities where there was no uh, there was no fish to be had, no processing to be had. Lar a large portion of them moved, and a large portion of those people were young people. So now we have this incredible demographic crisis that we're facing, which doesn't, of course, it's compounded. It compounds the economic crisis because if you don't have people to capitalize on the opportunities, then. But this, so, so that was an interesting kind of time to be to formative years, of course, and. And going through Memorial uh, University at that time was uh, was exciting and formative and very again just a great spot to be from. Everybody would say the same, I'm sure. But you were you were you, I'm going to you you've gone to policy, but I want to go back to you for just a minute. Yeah, I want to yeah. learn a little bit more about you. I mean, you weren't concerned about the COD moratorium when you were in high school. What kind of kid were you in high school? Were you an athlete? Were you bookish? Were you a stoner? What were you in high school? <laughs> uh, I was a, a little bookish, I, I think. I think my kids think I was a, a, a nerd, uh, but that's not true. Uh, I'd like to, I was definitely, uh, definitely not what I would consider athletic. Although I can rip up on the on the on the ski slopes. Um, I think I was a pretty social guy. I had many different groups. Um, like to like to party, but uh, not too hard and. Didn't really get serious about uh, schoolwork until probably I got into university, but uh, right. pretty diverse uh, group of friends and they helped shape me and of all different socioeconomic uh, status. Uh, it was, it's a great place to live because everybody supports everybody, whether you're uh, the, the captain of the hockey team or you're involved in student politics uh, through, which I was in, in, in high school. Or, uh, you know, you're the stoner that you described. It was very, every, like my buddies run the whole gamut, uh, yeah. the whole, you know, and, yeah. and they're still my friends today. And it's great. That, that is old friends are one of the most important things to have. Never trust anybody who doesn't have it's, old friends. It, yeah, exactly. And, you know, it's, I'm very fortunate. I mean, uh, some, the best man in my wedding was one of my best friends and, in grade school and, um, yeah, yeah. and you know we went to medical school together He's, you know i still run with him every week it's it's uh, it's you, you got to have that especially for this life <laughs> so you're a young doctor and all of a sudden you get involved in international philanthropy how did that happen yeah so it's an interesting story so i had done my uh, trauma training in baltimore very high volume um a trauma center uh, between Hopkins and University. I can of imagine. I've seen the wire. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. So it's so it's, it's, <laughs> it's you know there. I remember like kind of reading the brochure about the fellowship, and it's like, well, there's you know, it's only twenty percent penetrating trauma, so gunshots or knife wounds. Only twenty percent, and you know they had this volume of some crazy volume, ten thousand patients or something. 
Um, so I was, you know, I came back to Newfoundland and Labrador recognizing that that was not going to be the style of practice that I adopted here, hopefully. Um, but still had a, you know, still was fairly tight with the guys uh, from Hopkins in Maryland. Um, and they developed, after the earthquake, they developed a team of people who were going back and forth to Port-au-Prince. I reached out to uh, my former boss and said, you know, I, I want to be involved. Uh, how can I be involved? And at the time, uh, he suggested uh, one of the naval ships, the USS Mercy, I think it's called, uh, it's stationed in the harbor of Port-au-Prince. I contacted them. They were all like, yeah, sure, we'd love to have you. And uh, But my wife just said, no, no not, not at that point. Um, so fast forward a couple of weeks, I went back to her again. So we, and she's a doctor as well. So I said, why don't we both do it together? We'll go down and be a part of this team. And, and, and so we went down and operated on people who've been, you know, had broken bones from the earthquake uh, months after laying in tents. Um, and we did a lot of good work. Um, and it really changed me, David. It was, um, it was an eye-opening experience about the developing world and, and the medical conditions that they live, that they don't have, the medical procedures they don't have access to and what that actually does to families, to the economy. To, and so, um, you know, I, it, was, it was a great experience, but you were matched with people from all over the world, right? Like, so there was, a, you know, there was a nurse from Houston, there was a surgeon from Hopkins, there was uh, you know, another anesthesiologist from the University of Maryland and from tech, like just all over. And there's some inefficiency when you're going for a short period of time and trying in that professional environment, trying to learn each other's names and their skill sets. Like, you know, like, can you walk the talk? I mean, the anesthesiologist says he can put them to sleep with no electricity. And, you know, is that true? And it's, so there's a great degree of trust that needs to be built up. So when I came back to Newfoundland, I said, well, you know, we could do this. We could send a team from Newfoundland and Labrador. And I, I trust my anesthesiologists. I trust my nurses. They trust me. Why can't I just take 30 people down there and occupy a hospital for a week? And, you know, that'll be Newfoundland and Labrador's contribution to giving back to the people of, of Port-au-Prince after the earthquake. And it was supposed to be one trip. And so we went down. And then um, from there, you know, we did a great, great mission. It was excellent. Treated numerous patients. And uh, when we got back to the St. John's, I mean, my BlackBerry was just binging like crazy of all these people, many of whom most, in fact, had never done anything like it before in their life, wanted to know when we were going to go back. And uh, so I said, well, you know, maybe Newfoundland and Labrador can go a couple of times a year and then that'll be our thing. And um, so we did that. The next thing you know, people, it's just word of mouth. Canada is a small country, as you know, and word of mouth. Next thing you know, University of Calgary wants to get involved. Dalhousie wants to get involved. University of Toronto wants to get involved. Uh, BC. These were all largely cold calls. Just And I thought, you know, University of Calgary, University of Toronto, they want to take this model and make it their own. No, they just wanted to be a part of it. And so is it, that is one of the most rewarding things in my life to be a part of that experience and growing a true organic uh, foundation that continues today. And I mean, there was a, just a team in, in Guatemala last, last week uh, doing cleft lip and, and palate surgeries. So how do you That's take, Cana is. how do you take Canadian problems seriously after you've seen those problems? Yeah. So, I mean, you know, um, after that first trip, um, I struggled with that. Um, and, um, you know, I had difficult conversations with patients as a result. And I'll never forget driving home after, you know, someone complaining of lower back pain or something, which was really, truly significant to them. But having just come from a place where, you know, someone's leg was hanging off and, and you know, we're operating by flashlights and, like, it, 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 you know, the juxtaposition is, is difficult to reconcile. And I reconciled it this way, and it's something I told every every team member going forward because we'd have the you know briefings beforehand about how to get the team ready when you come back you will feel that and you just have to reset the needle to canadians it, it, it may not seem important in the global context but it is important to that patient that is important to them they don't live in Port-au-Prince. They don't know the challenges of Port-au-Prince. It's important to them. So you need to just do you need to compartmentalize it and just bring yourself back to Canada. And, so, and that's easier said than done often, but that's how I learned to live with it. It's just a, you get on the plane, you're landing back in Canada, needles reset. And those, those problems that may 
not be triaged to the top in Port-au-Prince or Ethiopia or Bangladesh are important here in Canada and they're important to the patients who have them. And that's why I got into medicine was for the patient contact to help individuals. So, you know, you just had to reset and, and uh, yeah, but I do think people struggle with that as they come back into the Canadian system. All right. Interesting. Well, thanks for yeah. sharing that. Here's an existential podcasting question for you, Hurley Burleyites. Is a podcast still a podcast if nobody's listening? I ask it semi-seriously, recognizing that in the early days of this show in 2017, nobody was listening. But that was their choice. And I'm damn grateful for the audience we've built in five and a half years. What happens when it's not a choice? More than ever before, there are extreme, sometimes catastrophic weather events that threaten connectivity. But our presenting sponsor, TELUS, thinks and acts differently when it comes to network resiliency and reliability. It's part of their culture, from an investing billions of dollars to build their network differently point of view, and from a humans pulling out all the stops to keep other humans connected in an emergency point of view. I want to focus here on one important way they build differently. Unlike some other carriers, TELUS has committed to fiber optic cables, replacing the older copper ones. Close to 70% of their network is now served by fiber. Their aim is to be 100% copper free. Copper may be cheaper, but fiber is just better in every way. It's faster and far more efficient at transferring huge amounts of data over longer distances, making it easier to do everything online all at once. Fiber is stronger and more durable. The optic strands don't degrade like copper and they're incredibly weather resistant so they can withstand storms and extreme weather events. Flooding or heavy rain will not impact their ability to provide connectivity. They won't corrode, break or short out like copper will. Fiber is not susceptible to signal interference or data errors like copper is. There's just more resilience and reliability wound up in every strand of Telus's fiber cable, early Burleyites, and more story to tell here. Tune in next week. All right, let's jump forward to your current job. And <clears throat> as I said in the intro, I've got a few specific... Can you keep specific... that on my old job? Yeah. <laughs> 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 well, yeah, we were talking about your, talking about your old hobbies. Uh, now yeah. you've got a new job. And, yeah. uh, and I to, you know, there's some issues I want to get into with you, but I thought maybe because I don't expect that most of my listeners are very familiar at all with what's going on in Newfoundland and Labrador. So I might ask you for a little primer, just a couple of minutes on the state of the nation in Newfoundland and Labrador. Sure. So um, in the Newfoundland and Labrador uh, has transformed itself over the last 20 years uh, because of the cod moratorium into an oil producing uh, province and very fortunate to have had that opportunity uh, to transform. Um, but uh, given that all eggs are in one commodity basket, uh, there has been some economic challenges over the last uh, 10 years in particular. I would argue it's not the Newfoundland and Labrador that, you know, you grew up with, uh, you know, going to high school and thinking about. It is a very different place. That said, there were still significant challenges over the last decade uh, to the point that, you um, the former premier, Premier Ball, uh, wrote the prime minister just before the pandemic and said they were struggling to to borrow T bills. Um, that has been an ongoing issue. It, and just to come back to the demographics, it's it it is largely compounded by this demographic crunch. So if you look at the '60s and '70s, for example, there was six kids for every senior in Newfoundland and Labrador. Today, there's two seniors for every kid. Right. So, you know, that, that sets up serious challenges. We have immense resources here, but we don't Makes have the Makes the CPP a challenge, that's for sure. And, 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 and provision of healthcare services, you know. They, yes, uh, for sure. With all due respect to some of my Western cousins, uh, younger, fitter population, less uh, complex uh, from a medical standpoint, obviously cost less. That said, David, over the last two, two or three years, I think we've really kind of taken the bull by the horns and, and, and recognized challenges as opportunities. We've really put a focus on, focus on immigration. It was the top, one of my top three priorities taking office. And I'm happy to say that even with that little bit of effort, making sure that government departments, as you would know in your previous life, are fully aligned, uh, we've managed to grow the population significantly quarter over quarter for the first, and we've had the biggest population increase since 1975. So the biggest in, in almost 50 years. The K to 12 population. Any pushback against that from the existing population? 
No, none. Uh, Newfoundlanders and Labradorians are uh, open, uh, open-minded, and have open hearts and open homes. And I can tell you, d- there's evidence of that. Even when what we decided to do after the terrible situ- in, situation in Ukraine, we took a different approach than some other provinces. We recognized the federal government was going to had to play a large role in immigration for these refugees. Uh, we we established a desk in Warsaw, Poland, a provincial desk, a Newfoundland and Labrador desk in Warsaw. Uh, and with the conceptually designed to allow refugees, millions of them, as you know, uh, a place that they could even learn about Canada, first of all. You have to think, put yourself, be empathetic to their plight and put yourself in their situation. They're fleeing with suitcases, yeah. showing up in Poland. They don't really know much about Canada. They don't probably can't identify it on a map, let alone Newfoundland and Labrador. Uh, we wanted to put a team there that would help them with the immigration process. Uh, we also used opportunities here so we matched them with jobs for example and then we hired our own planes we had a we had a plane from newfoundland and labrador land in st john's with ukrainian uh, refugees uh, before the federal government did even that's been so successful that ukrainians from across the country are relocating here whether that's because of the high cost of living in Mm -hmm. urban centers or frankly, the opportunities that are here uh, um, uh, within the community. And um, I mean, it's just, it's, so the, the response, I guess, to come back to your original question has been overwhelmingly positive. But if I could be, um, in, if I could be in politic for a second, yeah. Ukrainians are the least threatening immigrants you could imagine. They're fleeing a war with Russia and they're white. And the biggest cultural change they're likely to bring are pierogies and cabbage rolls. There's other immigrants that <laughs> no, I suspect... But we, but we, the other, there's no, other no, immigrants the, I suspect are less well received. I don't think so here in Newfoundland and Labrador. We uh, have uh, taken our, a larger share proportionally of Afghani refugees, for example. Um, right. And I can tell you the response was equivalent. Um, the, you know, we had a, a, a plane of uh, Afghani refugees, or almost a plane, okay. uh, show up. Um, Two years ago, I may be off yeah. with the math. Uh, yeah. Timelines get blurred in here, uh, but a, a full gymnasium full of people supporting them, uh, welcoming in their, their into their homes, David. To you know, right. and you know, offering right. them meals and and uh, items for children. And, uh, That's so, very encouraging. I mean, you know, Newfoundlanders and Labradorians are very opening. We all, uh, and open and loving. We always have been. Um, I well, you'll pardon my cynical question. I'm reassured. No, no, to hear no, me. no. I, you know, I, I think you know that's a question. I think that historically, um, you know, I, I'm not going to lie. Newfoundland and Labrador has been a largely homogeneous uh, population um, since the 14, late 1400s. Um, you know, and uh, I think that that change uh, is a cultural shift, um, and. I'd never get the sense, I used to get the sense that people were going to say they're going to take our jobs. I, d- I don't get that sense anymore. I get the sense that people see them as creating creating jobs, and there's great evidence to support that, right. and uh, really contributing to a more diverse society uh, here in, in the province. And I think whether it's a small team or a big team like a society, diversity breeds uh, invention, it breeds ingenuity, it breeds, uh, and it breeds a better outcome long term. Outstanding. Okay. Yeah. So, energy. Sorry, we got off topic though. We were talking about other, uh, you know, opportunities. Yeah. Sorry, before we go yeah. in. Well, this may bleed into energy. It's a good segue. Yeah. yeah you go ahead. Yeah. Because there's immense opportunity in the energy space. In Newfoundland. Well, that's where that's where I, that's where I want to go. But let me start with: You're a premier of an oil producing province. What is your opinion of the federal government's climate policy and its emission goals? Well, I think that we can play a large part of it. Uh, I think. Uh, First of all, are they too uh, aggressive? Well, I think we can play a large part of it. Um, <laughs> I think you know you can walk and chew gun. I've said it many times. You can. Pre- by the way, net zero by 2050 doesn't mean no oil and gas. Right. We have some of the lowest carbon footprint oil petroleum products on our offshore. They're not landlocked. Um, Beta Nor, for example, will be eight kilograms per per ton, and, or, and you look at. You know, the oil sands, it's 80. Uh, so there's a big discrepancy there. So our product, I would argue, is the, is the one that we should be looking at, recognizing that oil and gas is going to be required in the next 
20 uh, to 30 years and beyond, frankly. So it's, it's like a diet. If you're on a diet and you have a full, car- if you have full calorie drink or a diet drink, which one should be, you should be, be choosing? And I would argue that we should be choosing the product that we have. That said, we, you know, in Newfoundland and Labrador, we know that the climate crisis is real. We think you should be using a lower carbon uh, footprint, a lower carbon footprint product. We have that. But we also have immense opportunity that I would argue other jurisdictions don't have in, in the renewable space. Okay. Uh, so Newfoundland and Labrador is well positioned right now uh, to harness uh, the opportunity on both, on both sectors. And in the, you know, on the renewable space, of course, everybody, I hope most would be familiar with our immense hydroelectric capacity. Uh, but we also have uh, an opportunity to really be a uh, first mover, uh, an industrial player uh, with respect to the hydrogen space. We have, as you know, you've been here, it's quite a windy spot. Uh, so, what, you know, we have the wind, we have an incredible amount of land. Uh, we have uh, we have an incredible amount of fresh water. Uh, we have a workforce that's used to transitioning in a marine climate, and we have deep sea ports that have access to uh, unharbored un- access to uh, the northeastern seaboard and Europe. Um, so we can really, I do believe Newfoundland and Labrador has a strong role to play in the alternative fuel source, which uh, hydrogen certainly seems like. It's it's leading it's leading the way. So, you know, while we will still continue to produce uh, oil and gas, we are transitioning as well to uh, renewable energy space, which is quite exciting for us, as it represents a greenfield space for us. And I think it's a, it's an it is important opportunity for Newfoundland and Labrador, not just for tomorrow, but for generations uh, to come. I mean, you look around the world; the world seems to be betting on hydrogen. Yeah. And uh, whether that's in Saudi Arabia using solar and then desalinization uh, to use that water to drive the electrolysis process, we don't have to do that. We have fresh water, we have wind, uh, we have the ability to do most of it here in Newfoundland and Labrador. And some of the contentious issues surrounding windmills that have been a, you know, in other jurisdictions around the world yeah. don't really exist here to a large extent because we have such... An uninhabited coastline, for example, there's plenty of opportunity to uh, to have these uh, develop. They are going to change the iconic look of the place, though. Well, it's a huge coastline. You can't forget. You know, like it's not. I can't imagine there's going to be. Uh, you know, in every uh, nook and cranny on our coast. Right. Uh, so um, they will change the look of some places, no question. But as I said, there are ma- there are many uninhabited uh, areas around our beautiful province that the, that these uh, that these uh, devices and opportunity can belong can 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 be and, and unlock a greenfield opportunity. I want to talk for a moment about government regulation, something we have a fair amount of in Canada. It's complicated. There's general agreement that governments should not try to oversee and manage the economy, but there's also a natural urge to demand that governments step in when problems hit home. Supply chains are a good example. Our sponsor, CN, is perhaps the most vital link in Canada's supply chains, because just about everything moves by train. And supply chains have been gummed up worldwide for years now. War and the pandemic and changing weather have caused disruptions, which have caused shortages, which have in turn caused inflation and even higher interest rates. It's affected just about everybody. Inevitably, there have been suggestions that the solution lies with more government and more regulation, expanding the power of agencies to intervene, for example, and to exert more control over supply chain participants, to perhaps oblige railways to accept and manage more of each other's cargo, trading it back and forth across the country or forcing transportation companies to prioritize one industry's products over another. CN would respectfully suggest that our supply chain participants know their jobs better than anyone, and that more regulation would more than likely increase costs, dampen investment, and dilute service. And it says that as a railway that has moved record amounts of grain out of the prairies to domestic and foreign markets in recent months. The fact is, every link in the supply chain is at the mercy of all the other links, manufacturers, railways, shippers, truckers, ocean-going ships, and government terminals, to name several. And the only way our domestic supply chains will operate at maximum capacity is for all the players to coordinate transparently, collaboratively, and constantly. CN pledges to do just that. It is utterly committed to moving cargo and delivering it on time.
But you started your description of Newfoundland by calling it an oil-producing province, that it had transformed from a fishing province into an oil-producing province, and that you were relying on a single commodity. Why aren't you as white-hot about the federal policies as the provinces of Saskatchewan and Alberta are? Well, because I see that we have different opportunities. Uh, we have... Uh, we can we can capitalize on uh, the renewable space uh, and the aggressive climate targets that the federal government, I think, rightfully has set. Okay. Um, and we can still we can still produce oil and gas. I, I would argue that the hydrogen space that I just described doesn't yeah. exist in some of the other jurisdictions that you just described. And we have an and I will blue say, hydrogen, you know, I blue hydrogen, oil not green hydrogen. <laughs> No, we can be we can be green hydrogen. No, I know, but the other places can only do blue. Yeah. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Exactly right. Um, and even you know some of our maritime cousins, uh, you know, their their backup for hydrogen production is going to have to be still be going through using coal. So that I don't know what color that would be, but you know it wouldn't be black green hydrogen. hydrogen. Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, we really think that, but I will just point out that I described us as an oil producing province, but that was in describing the, the ebbs and flows of the, uh, of the commodity swings. But we have, to, we're still a fishing province. We, uh, we also have an immense opportunity on the renewable space, recognizing the mineral opportunities that we have here in the province. Everyone talks about critical minerals. Well, we have them here in, in, in this province, whether it's copper or nickel. And they can be produced at a lower carbon footprint, which I think is very attractive uh, to industry developers and customers alike. Our product, for example, in iron is so pure, it requires less heat, for example, to, uh, to refine. And as a result, you can use electricity to refine it, which means that it's, a, it's a, of course, a more attractive product uh, development uh, than uh, iron that's produced in Australia, Brazil, other places. So we have a... Um, we are diversifying the economy. It's not. It's no longer. So we went from fish to oil and gas. But you know, we, the oil and gas has served us well. We're not turning our backs on it at all. And in fact, I still very much believe in it at this moment of human history and transition. Uh, but uh, we've also diversified the economy uh, to try to mitigate and mute uh, any uh, such any big swings in the commodity price. Okay. Right. Speaking of white hot anger. I think one of the first things I ever learned about Newfoundland as a young person was that Newfoundland had been incredibly ripped off by Quebec in a contract for electricity. And the contract went on forever. Hey, Ontarians, if you think the privatization of the 407 is the worst deal that a government has ever made, you've not heard of Churchill Falls. Um and uh, so maybe you can tell us a little bit about that deal. But most excitingly, <laughs> it's coming to a conclusion after all this time, 70 years or something like that, this thing's been in place. And yes, you're going right. to get a yeah. chance to renegotiate it. And I'm very curious about what's going to go down there. Yeah, so, I mean, historically, this has been a, a source of, uh, of great frustration uh, for Newfoundlanders and Labradorians. Um, it's also been used as and weaponized as for political gain over the years. Um, so uh, historically, for your for your listeners and viewers, uh, this uh, deal was done between Joey Smallwood. That's how far back we're going, and the Quebec government. Nineteen um, sixties. In the nineteen sixties, and it extended the development of a massive hydroelectric project over five thousand megawatts in Labrador. Uh, for export uh, through Quebec into the northeastern seaboard, largely. Um, the problem with the deal, anyone can do a deal. The problem with the deal was it was guaranteed fixed, <laughs> fixed rate. So it was a cheap rate even for the early 70s, right. 0.2 cents a kilowatt hour. 0.2 cents a kilowatt hour, Dave. Yeah, that know. still exists today. They're yes, I so Hydro, Hydro Quebec buys the electricity for 0.2 cents a kilowatt hour. Not two cents, right. 0.2 cents a kilowatt It's hour. effectively free. Go, effectively free. Um, you know, you know the, I've, there have been many premiers before me who tried to uh, break that deal. There have been Supreme Court challenges. Um, I've recognized that coming into office that this is a historic moment because although 2041 is, you know, 18 years away, 
in utility terms, that's today. Um, yeah. So if Hydro-Quebec is looking to sell power based on our, our capacity here, we have 15% of, of their capacity. That's what the Upper Churchill Falls represents. Uh, and it's firm. It's, it's a dam. It's, it will be, so there's capacity and energy. But um, they're selling long-term 20, 30, 40-year deals either to industrial customers or to the northeastern seaboard. They, the paradigm has shifted. And I think if they're going to replace Churchill Falls, that's a very complex um, set of dams and re diversion of diversion of dams uh, through indigenous lands and it's very complicated um and it's not as easy as just saying well we'll replace 5000 we'll replace 15% of our power with with you know new dams so uh, you know we think that we're at a very good spot here in Newfoundland and Labrador for the first time in a long time uh, i think i've taken a different approach of not trying to make Quebec the boogeyman. I mean, they, they did a deal. It was a bad deal. It was bad on us uh, for not looking at escalators not lo- and, and agreeing to a fixed rate. Um, that said, uh, you know, we need to look forward. This asset is incredibly valuable. It can, I don't want to overstate it uh, because other politicians have, but it could dis- definitively change the fiscal situation of the province in a stroke of a pen. Who can you sell and it to besides I've, Quebec? I've, so we could sell it, well, for example, right now, I, I, we talked about the critical mineral space, right? Like yep. There is customers in Labrador, domestic industrial customers in Labrador, who would gobble up thousands of megawatts so that they could sell their nickel on the market <laughs> as being more green because right. everybody's looking at the carbon footprint of everything. Right. So yep. it was a real eye opener for me in COP at 26 in Scotland uh, to sit with the head of IOC and uh, Rio Tinto, sorry. And for, for him to explain that to me, it was, of course that makes total sense. So they're, they, they're interested in the power. Um, there's of course, hydrogen plays that weren't there uh, three or four years ago. Um, so, you know, it's, it's not the single customer negotiation anymore. There are right. other levers, other avenues that didn't exist prior to this massive disruption in the energy space. Um, so I think we're in a good position. That said, you know, I've, I've assembled a 2041 panel of experts, electricity experts, uh, to provide some advice. Uh, and if their advice comes back that Quebec is the reasonable a partner in this, then uh, I'm not going to, uh, you know, be ripping down flags and making them public <laughs> number one. I mean, I'm interested in in creating a path forward here. I've uh, I've said that from day, you know, from day one. Uh, even went to visit uh, Premier Legault in Quebec myself. One of the first kind of trips I took off the island after the Atlantic bubble was dissolved. Well, he obviously um, saw the whites so of your eyes because he's instructed Hydro Quebec <laughs> to find a Plan B. Said I'm not going into negotiations with that guy without a plan B. (laughs) So we're in a good spot, I think, strategically, and you know, (laughs) I'm not going to negotiate through through a podcast, but uh, I do believe there's an opportunity. I I do believe there's an opportunity here for Newfoundland and Labrador. There is no question about it. And every day that goes by, uh, it's we're in a better spot. And if he thinks he can build dams, uh, I've got a little playbook here that. That we just kind of went through that dams aren't as easy to build and execute on as you think. And even by their own admission, if they were to do that, it would be 11 cent kilowatt hours, not, you know, 0.2 cents. So, I, I, you know, there's a deal to be had here I, if that's the route we choose. But I'm waiting to hear back from the expert panel about all the different avenues to, to investigate. Is there a desire in Newfoundland for retribution? Like, if you came back with it, what is an entirely reasonable deal that Hydro-Quebec was happy with, are you going to be pilloried for not having extracted some revenge? Well, you know, I, <laughs> I mean, you know, this is, it's hard to understate how uh, punitive this deal has been. Uh, and I know. So, um, for a very poor province, it's been ex- an extraordinary injustice in the Confederation. Uh, and, and no doubt. And when you look even, you know, about the, the key is, of course, the transmission lines. It's our generation, but no way to get it anywhere. And but that all seemed to evaporate when people are building pipelines, uh, you know. So like there, there is a, 
I, I, you can't overstate. I, I, I guarantee you walk down the streets of Montreal, no one knows about the Upper Churchill contract. You won't pick out anyone on the streets of Duckworth, George, or, you know, everybody knows about the Upper Churchill contract. Um, I do think w there is a large degree of resentment about the contract. Um, but if there is a path forward uh, that is reasonable with some recognition, by the way, of the punitive nature of this contract in the past, that is important politically, it's important socially, and it will be important part of any fiscal arrangement should we decide to do it. Uh, so I don't want to put the cart ahead of the horse. I guess it depends on what it all looks like. I can tell you with 100 degree certainty, I'm not going to do a bad deal. And I'm not going to do a deal that Newfoundlanders and Labradorians won't believe in, not for the future of this place. Right. Okay, cool. Let's flip ahead to healthcare. You're a doctor. You <laughs> actually tell me, I played one on TV. Yeah, right? You actually come to the table with a little bit of knowledge. First of all, just quickly, are, are you having the same problems with overburdened systems that other jurisdictions in Canada are? Is your healthcare system absolutely. in trouble right now? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, for being honest, and I said this uh, before, uh, the system was in trouble before the pandemic. It's just the pandemic has accelerated uh, the numerous crises, if you will, uh, throughout the system. I, my big concern in these conversations is that there is a generational opportunity here for us as Canadians um, to reinvent this healthcare system for the future. We have a system, by and large, that is still designed for the 1960s, and it needs to be modernized. To, it needs to capture current technologies. It needs to capture the changing paradigm in the way people practice. Um, so that it is a sustainable healthcare system, one that Canadians can once again be proud of. So that is, that is the opportunity that has been given to us in a perverse way through this this time of disruption with with the pandemic. Um, and we are focused on making sure that we don't lose that opportunity. So the negotiations are one thing, but the operations are something different. And I set out, even despite the challenges of the pandemic, knowing that the, this was a problem, had all stakeholders involved, uh, all parties involved, frankly, in something we called the Health Accord NL, which looked at, you know, the drivers, uh, the opportunities, how we can reinvest to meet the demands of, of what Newfoundland and Labrador looks like today, not from not what it looked like in the 1960s. So we already have a plan uh, that we plan to execute on. Um, and I mean, I'd love to kind of get what into the major elements. What here. does it look like? Yeah, so what, let's talk about why we're here first, because I think it yeah. it really yeah. kind of, people gloss over it very quickly as a provider. There's been a huge shift in the, in the way that medicine and nursing is practiced, right? So, you know, even from when I went to medical school, like the, the tradition of graduating and going to a community and hanging a shingle, like that could be rural Saskatchewan, rural Newfoundland, yeah. the challenges yeah. are the same hanging a shingle, seeing people from cradle to grave uh, as a sole practitioner or, you know, there with somebody else. And in rural uh, areas of, of our beautiful country, of course, that means, you know, treating strokes after midnight and broken arms in the middle of your supper and all those kinds of things. Also That's means being one of the most respected members of your community, right? Sure. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. But, but people don't want to practice that way anymore. They're not trained that way anymore, David. They're trained to practice as part of a team. And as those people who, God loves them, are, are exiting the system, we're having a, a, the leading edge of a new system start. So you're having people who want a significant work-life balance uh, come into the practice of medicine. And those exiting never really contemplated fully the same level of workplace of work life balance that the new practitioners are i would argue correctly demanding right um, so that that sets up a huge problem with human resources number 1 the medical schools are still enrolling people like the old like they're, they're, like people are going to go out and see 5000 patients and and that's just not the case and i've said these this very thing in in rural communities that romantic notion doesn't exist anymore. And the longer that we hold on to that, the harder it is going to be to change the system. So it's not just the But everybody that. wants to have a family it, physician. Everybody wants to have a person no, that so, they know so, that they can call, right? 100%. And so that's why here in, in the province, one of the planks of this health accord is creating collaborative team clinics. 
And so what I mean by that is, as, as a provider, you would be part of a group of professionals. So you would be, you know, of course, there's a family, family doctor, nurse practitioners, nurses, physiotherapists, social workers, all part of a team. That allows those individuals, those professionals to practice to their full scope, first of all. It allows them to get rid of the bureaucratic practice of medicine, by the way, which no one trains you about and <laughs> trains you for in medical school, how to pay secretaries, workers' comp, snow clearing, phones, running a business. Like, no one tra tra trains you for that. So it eliminates that. So it's attractive for the providers, but it also is attractive for the patients. So the patients will know that it doesn't matter if Dr. You know, Hurley is away. They know that they'll have access to someone in that circle of care. It's almost so certainly better. It's a change. <laughs> yeah. So, it, it, you know, like if you just need if you just need a renewal on your prescription, you're probably wasting your family doctor's time. You know, if you need a, if you need a if you need a more complex kind of solution, like that's what family doctors and primary care providers are trained for. So, creating these collaborative team clinics, it's a win for the patients. And it's a win for the providers. Because if you're a provider and you say, well, I want to take two weeks off, like I, my wife is, used to practice in primary family medicine, that would mean trying to find a locum, uh, you know, someone to fill in, you're losing money because you're not there, but you still have to pay the, you know, the business part. But so you will know with good conscience that someone is going to, someone in that circle of care is going to look after you. But the change is that it won't be the standard relationship between doctor and patient. You know, you know that you will have access to someone and they will have access to all your medical care records, right. but it won't be the same as seeing, you know, the same doctor for your earache when you're eight until you, you know, your high blood pressure when you're 60, like that will, that will change significantly. And I think it's a win-win for, for both sides. Why are we having trouble getting people to go into healthcare? Like going to nursing, like you're sending, you're sending ministers over to Ireland to try to steal nurses from Ireland, which sounds like, by the way, more fun than most cabinet uh, <coughs> assignments. Um, but like, why, why don't, why do we have a shortage of nurses everywhere in Canada? Well, I think it's, it's part of what I just described. There's a change in the way they practice too, right? Um, I mean, my wife works in the pediatric emergency department here. Um, the, the new nurses are rightfully, I think, and this is, this is said without any criticism. This is observation of why we're here. Rightfully saying that they want work-life balance. They don't want to be mandated after, you know, after hours. They want their, want to know their summer vacation in advance. All things that, you know, the general public may not know don't always exist. Um, so what they're doing, instead of taking full-time jobs, they're taking casual jobs which means that they don't have any benefits, they don't have, you know, they don't have a pension, but they have the flexibility in their own practice to say, I'm going to get married next August, I want those two weeks off or whatever. That, that's a change, that's a massive change, but what that's, ha what that's doing then is putting more pressure on the nurses who have, are full-time. And because they're having to, to cover shifts that are left vacant as well. So, I mean... You know we're not we're not producing enough. First of all, um, in in the in our in our nursing schools here in Newfoundland and Labrador, we've increased it by twenty five percent. But that'll take you know four years to to see the fruits of that seed. And we're not producing enough. But there's also been a, a huge change in the in and rightfully so the way that uh, nurses want to practice. So we need to Is that produce we're more. We're not paying or, them enough. Um, you know, I think we're you know they can always stand to be these, these people work on the front lines. Um, I mean, they're heroes, you know, they, I say all the time to my cabinet and caucus colleagues and everyone, like you look, do the research. The social evidence is the most trusted profession in the world. It's not a priest, not a doctor, certainly not a politician. It is always year after year, a nurse. No one asks what goes in the IV. Everyone thinks they're there to support them, and they are. It is a beautiful career. My mom was a nurse. It's a yeah. beautiful, substantive career. I think, I hope, and I've had some of these high-level conversations with some lead stakeholders, leaders, is that this current crisis doesn't turn a full generation off what is truly a special career. People take you in their trust. You make a difference to their lives immediately. It's a beautiful, beautiful career that... 
um, hopefully, as, as you know, we, we support them more through human resources and through perhaps increased remuneration or different models, um, it will become uh, more desirable once again. But I still think it's a desirable, uh, desirable uh, place to work because it is intrinsically very rewarding. I just think whenever somebody tells me nobody's going into a certain profession, I look, first of all, to the compensation. There is no shortage of investment yeah. bankers or people going into investment banking, right? Um, well, we've and- not, David, we've not really had a problem fulfilling uh, the enrollment. Uh, people are still enrolling. Um, it's hard to understate that change. It sounds very simple, and it, you know, it sounds, but that, the, the downstream impact of that on, on the practice of nursing is, is quite large, of course. You know? So whether it's a nurse who's retiring or a doctor who's retiring, it's going to take more than just one to fill that gap. It's going to take two, three, maybe even more, depending on, on how they're practicing. So you know, we've increased enrollment here. We've also set up a desk similar to the Warsaw desk in India to help attract uh, nurses with the nursing college here to get rid of that red tape to say, look, you know, they're being educated in a very similar curriculum. Uh, we don't have to repeat, we don't have to kind of reinvent the wheel every time there's a new candidate from one of these institutions. We can just cut and paste. They have the same credentials, and hopefully that will bear some fruit over time as well. So there's a meeting now. Uh, as of this oh, morning, there's, <laughs> there's a rumor that there is a meeting uh, February 7th, I think. Yes. Uh, yeah. Of the first ministers. And we all know that the prime minister doesn't go to a meeting unless the deal is already done. So the deal is already done. So you're going to get a whack of money from the feds. What are you going to do with it? Well, you know, first of all, I'm not sure the deal is finally done. I think that, you know, um, I think there will be uh, serious uh, discussions around shared priorities. I don't like the word string atta- strings attached. I think that that lended itself, uh, you know, created a gap perhaps that wasn't uh, truly as as big a gap as people in, in the general public and perhaps the media thought. Um, I think there's still many, many discussions to be had on those shared priorities. For us, we'll invest in primary care and access to primary care through expansion of these collaborative team clinics, which I've discussed. We'll invest in surgical wait lists, whether that's in investing in increased infrastructure or utilizing differently infrastructure that exists throughout our province. We'll invest in uh, technology, whether that's enhancing and updating our electronic records or or providing uh, more virtual care uh, for some of the emergency departments, more emergency support uh, throughout our province. Uh, Or uh, human resource retention and recruitment and mental health and addictions. Those are kind of the those are the priorities that I see. There's a whole other level, though, that we haven't talked about and no one has talked, or a few people have talked about. And that's the degree of social spending and the social determinants of health. Like We're, we're only talking about treating health. We're not talking about changing health. And I think it's a conversation that's been neglected. If you look at the investments that the federal government has made over the last... I'm not going to stick to two drinks a week, no matter what you say to me, Doc, <laughs> Dr. Fury. <laughs> I'll just say the reserve comments on, on that, but I, 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 do, I do enjoy a foreign rum. So, um, the, but the, the social determinants, the social investments have remained largely flat. Well, they've increased exponentially, 230%, I think, over the last 20 or 30 years here in Canada, about the delivery of health care. But, of course, it's too late when the diabetic has to come in for surgery. You know, you need to, you, we need to be inventive about how we're approaching the ser- social determinants of health. And that requires investment. It requires behavior modification. and It, re- and it, it requires a healthy education campaign uh, to the general populace. But I, th- I hope that that doesn't get lost in the overall discussion. I fear it has. Um, but you look at why things haven't worked to date, why all these investments of big buckets of money haven't worked to date, I would argue that that is one of the reasons why it hasn't worked. We haven't invested properly in, in the social determinants of health. So I'm all worked up about something. Let me run it by you. Uh-oh. I'm all worked <laughs> up about the fact that Ford, Premier Ford in Ontario has signaled that one of the ways he's going to reform health care in this province is to encourage more profit for profit delivery of healthcare procedures and services. And Prime Minister Trudeau has indicated he really has no problem with that and he sees that as an innovation. 
I see that as the middle edge of the wedge toward two-tier health care. Are you going to be moving in that direction? Uh, no, we won't be. Um, I think um, I, I'm more aligned, I would argue, probably. And I'm never going to, like, don't take this as a criticism of what someone else does in their own jurisdiction. And that's, that's his healthcare system to run, and I respect it uh, fully. Uh, I think the comments of uh, Dr. Bell are, are, um, are quite aligned with where we would like to be here. There are ways to be efficient, uh, but you can unlock that through non for profit. Uh, mechanisms. And um, there are certainly ways to be more efficient. I can tell you, um, you know, from my own experience as being a surgeon and waiting around for three hours in between cases, you, you want you, get, you want to pull your hair out. And I don't have much left. So, you know, it gets, it gets frustrating. Um, there are ways to become more efficient uh, in, in decanting some of those from the general tertiary care hospitals into surgical centers. But my approach would be not-for-profit run. And so that enables the access to the efficiency while being responsible with pu the public purse, ensuring that people who paid the tax dollars to have the provision of services are not just uh, making a company more wealthy. Cool. Hey, I'm running out of time with you, and I won't ask a premier to give me more than an hour. So I just am going to ask one more question, and it's quite political to you before we wrap up. By the way, thank you for that. Went fast. Yeah, it's gone. Yeah, it's gone, really it's gone super fast, and yeah. I would keep you longer, but you've got yeah. a province to run. Um, so, you are, as I said in the intro, the last remaining Liberal Premier um, in Canada, um, and your mandate runs out in twenty twenty five. That means theoretically that if you were to lose and Trudeau were to lose, there might be no Liberal governments left in Canada at that point in time. What's your general take on what the Liberal Party represents in Canada and what its importance is? Just a softball question for the end there, hey, David? Or, uh, yeah. <laughs> well, no, I think, you know, um, the Liberal Party right now uh, represents and should represent, and, you know, you could argue should it represent it more fully, um, uh, the centre of the, of the country. Uh, it's certainly, I can't speak for the National Party, I can speak for where we are here in Newfoundland and Labrador, is I take a very centrist approach, whether that's on uh, some of the topics we've already discussed. I don't believe, I think it's good, good public media debate to have these two polarized views always. I don't believe in my heart that that's truly what Canada is currently. I think it's being projected, arguably, for political purposes on either side of that, that, that equation. I think most Canadians, in fact, the vast majority of Canadians are in the middle and they want to see a country that reflects uh, who they are and the values that they bring. And I think there's plenty of room in that center to be fiscally wise and socially progressive. And that's the Canada I believe I grew up in. That's the Canada I think that most people reflect and think they know. I think there's a lot of concern right now about about either either side of the extreme, the ultra, you know, the ultra woke or the ultra right. Um, but I don't I, I, I think that's sensationalized. I think the majority of Canadians are in the middle. And I think that that's where the, you know, speaking politically, that's where the battleground is. Uh, you won't see me drifting, I can assure you to either, either side of, of that. I, mean, I intend to stay straight down the middle because I think that that's the best path forward. Uh, I think you can, you can certainly be socially progressive and fiscally wise at the same time. And I think that's, that's what most Canadians would want uh, from their politicians. Premier Fury, thank you so much for making the time to be here and to be so frank and candid with us about what your thoughts are. Um, I've, uh, found this to be a really fascinating conversation and it leaves me hoping that your French is good. <laughs> <laughs> Sir, I hope you'll Thanks, do it. Th th this has been, a, this has been a great, the only thing I, you know, I wish that I had heard of course, and perhaps I'm going to have to turn into a different podcast is uh, to hear the beautiful voice 
of that legendary Newfoundlander and Labradorian say, come to the Hey Yous. <laughs> yeah. Gordon Pinsent really uh, dresses uh, up our, the curse of politics, doesn't he? Takes a, takes uh, a group of ne'er-do-wells and turns them into fit-for-dinner people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's a, he's a legendary Newfoundlander and Labradorian, one we're all very proud of. What a thrill it was so to have him do that it for us. It warms my heart to hear that. I'm yeah, awesome. Listen, you go do your good work, and I hope someday you'll come back on and update us on everything that uh, we've talked about and what's going on. In the meantime, it was wonderful to talk to you. Take care of yourself. Thanks, David. I want to thank our presenting sponsor, TELUS, and our sponsor, CN Rail. And I want to thank everybody who watched or listened to this show. And if you tune in next week, we'll be back with more Hurley Burley, but not Premier Fury. Hurley Burley.